coming up on this episode of Inside the Epicenter. If you ask almost any reporter or any academic or any politician, they would say the number one supporters of Israel, at least in the United States, are evangelical Christians. And that's true, and it's still true. And this new poll confirms that it's true. The problem is that something is not getting transmitted from the older generation to the younger generation. And the younger generation is seeing things or hearing things that are troubling them about Israel. Is Israel in danger of losing U.S. evangelical support? Could the trend lines of younger evangelicals lead to a collapse of support from evangelicals in the U.S. of the state of Israel? Welcome to Inside the Epicenter with Joel Rosenberg, a podcast of the Joshua Fund, a ministry dedicated to blessing Israel and her neighbors in the name of Jesus. I'm Carl Muller, Executive Director of the Joshua Fund, and I'm joined by Joel Rosenberg again. Joel, welcome. You're back in Jerusalem, and I'm here in the U.S. It's good to see you again, brother. It's good to see you, Carl, but you, we picked a, a very sobering uh, topic for uh, one of the early uh, new uh, podcasts of season two. Yeah, it's true. We've spoken about this issue before in in one of our earlier podcasts, but you've done a new survey and there's some really troubling trend lines that we want to talk about. But, you know, some of this is not new. As we said, we've talked about it, but but Joel, maybe you could highlight, you know, what this new survey shows and, and maybe some of the things that are taking place right now among younger evangelicals as your survey found out. Yeah, happy to talk about it, even though not hap- uh, happy, but but I'm happy to talk about it because that's what this podcast is about. <laughs> it's trying to understand what in the world is going on right. Right, <laughs> with Israel, with her neighbors, with evangelicals who love Israel. And I realize, of course, that not everybody listening to this podcast is an evangelical or even a Christian. But the point is, there are some serious troubles a- brewing <laughs> when it comes <laughs> to how evangelicals, at least in the United States, look at Israel because there's this huge gap uh, between how parents and grandparents look at Israel and the Jewish people and how their children and grandchildren look at Israel Mm. and the Jewish people. And you're right, we did talk about this in season one. And the reason we did was because if you ask almost any reporter or any academic or any politician they would say the number one supporters of Israel, at least in the United States, are evangelical Christians. And that's true, and it's still true. And this new poll uh, confirms that it's true. The problem is that something is not getting transmitted from the older generation to the younger generation, and the younger generation is seeing things or hearing things that are troubling them about Israel. And so what we looked at in season one was data from several years ago that you know you and I thought were relevant and were, because that was the strongest data that we had at the time. I'm part of a coalition of Christian academics and other scholars and authors and ministry leaders, pastors, who have formed something called the Alliance for the Peace of Jerusalem. It's an organization that uh, actually loves Israel and its neighbors, I wouldn't have helped found the alliance if that wasn't the case because that's so much part of my and Lynn's theological and personal worldview and it certainly is baked into the DNA of the Joshua Fund. And so I love these uh, men and women because they're super bright, brighter than me, and they are seminary professors and presidents of seminaries and Bible colleges and so forth. Anyway, we did this survey uh, five years ago, but a new survey was taken just last summer, the summer of 2021. And just listen to some of the the, the data. Um, so in All Israel News, I wrote a series of five columns about this survey in December when it was released because it was so sobering. I thought, I can't deal with it in one article. But I'll just, let me just read a couple lines and pieces of data from one of the articles. 
Another striking result of the survey is that younger evangelicals are becoming far less supportive of Israel than their parents and grandparents. At the same time, they're becoming far more supportive of the Palestinian cause than older evangelicals. Now, let me pause there just for a moment. You and I have talked about this before. It's not a problem if Christians of any age, any background, anywhere in the world show compassion and love towards Palestinians. All right, that's a good thing. Exactly. Jesus said, yeah, they were made in the image of God. Jesus said to love your neighbor. And even if you say, well, they're not your neighbor, they're your enemy. Okay, then love your neighbor and your enemy. That's what Jesus said as a Jew walking through what today would be called the West Bank, then was called uh, Judea and Samaria. These are the biblical heartlands. So I just want to say up front, right, that we're not saying, you know, supporting Palestinians is wrong. But what we're looking at is why is there this split? So here's some specific numbers. Only a combined 12% of younger evangelicals of all races and all backgrounds, 12% say they have support for Israel or a very strong support for Israel. 12%. Wow. Yikes. Now, if you add in younger evangelicals who say they lean towards supporting Israel, that combined total reaches only 29%. Hmm. Okay. Now, if you take their parents and grandparents, evangelicals that are older than the age of 30, that's the split that we made here. I mean, we took mm -hmm. several bands in this new alliance study, but the short version is if you take the older generation, they're at 56% support for Israel, including the leaners, okay? Mm -hmm. Now, there's a few more pieces of data, but let me just say this. The 56% number is, is a problem, too. Because yeah. in 2017, when we released the first alliance study, that number was around 75%. Wow. So... The question is, has all evangelical support dropped by 20 points? Yeah. And most of that comes from the young people, right? If you're down in the less than 30%, then that's where you're seeing the collapse. Right. I just want to make a couple quick points, and then you can take me where yeah. you want to go or make you know, obviously yeah. your own comments. But I made a point in the article in All Israel News that's important to say here. Two different firms did these two different studies, okay? The first one was done in 2017 by Lifeway Research, which mm -hmm. is a research arm of the Southern Baptist Convention, mm -hmm. okay? And the second, more recent survey was done by two Jewish, not believers in Jesus, scholars at the University of North Carolina. Okay. Now, both firms, both polling units were retained by the Alliance for the Peace of Jerusalem, okay? And we really like these guys at, at the UNC. So I'm not making a criticism. I'm just saying it's different. That's the yeah. first thing, just putting our cards on the table. But the sure. second thing is methodology. The Southern Baptists, what we asked them to do was say, how do you define an evangelical? And the evangelicals were defined if the respondent to the telephone call agreed strongly with four basic points about what an evangelical is. These are the points we made in episode one of season one. Right, what right. is an evangelical, right? We believe that Jesus is uh, the Messiah, the Christ. Uh, he is, and the only way to God, the only way to heaven. Two, that he, that the Bible is our highest authority for information about who God is and how he wants us to live. Three, that we have an obligation, a responsibility to tell other people that Jesus is the Messiah and that the gospel is the only remedy for sin and the only way to get to heaven. And four, if you don't receive Jesus as the Messiah, then there's a consequence, which the Bible calls hell. Mm -hmm. So those are the four basic components. Now, if a person in the first survey in 2017 said, yeah, yeah, I strongly agree with all of that, we classified them as an evangelical Christian. Sure. Sure. Okay. Mm -hmm. In this case, the pollsters just said, how would you describe yourself uh, religiously? This, 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 or this. An evangelical Christian was one of the options. And if a person said, yeah, I'm an evangelical Christian, then they continued on with the study. If they didn't say that, then they were, you know, thank you very much. That's the end of the survey and 
and the connection was cut. Why is that important? Because you're going to pick up more people who say they're evangelicals right. in the second version than maybe actually hold to those four critical and foundational and fundamental views of what an evangelical is. Therefore, you have the risk that you're you're going to get more people who are more liberal theologically. Right. They're not orthodox in their views theologically. That could skew the numbers. And, and therefore, let me just wrap up this point to say this. I'm not ready to compare the apples and the oranges. I don't see the way to compare the 2017 data to the current data. Right. So I'm not going to do that. Right. I, I, I'm urging people, uh, advising them, Let's not compare those two. What, what the 2017 study showed us was definitely a concern that younger evangelicals didn't see Israel and the Jewish people the same way as their parents. The gap wasn't as big as this current version. Right. But five years later, it could be that we're picking up yeah. a collapse, but it could be that we've picked up a wider sample, but it still is, tells us a lot of very important and, and, and frankly, troubling information. Sure. Sure. Well, not to get into any uh, academic uh, survey design and comparisons, but, you know, blending and changing methodologies in the mix of uh, all of the uh, results of a survey is, is a surefire way to get uh, yourself uh, bad information. However, I think your point is absolutely true with this new survey. There is a gap and there's a troubling consistency between these two surveys, even though they're not the same methodology, and that is that there's a differential, a strong differential between younger evangelicals and older evangelicals. I mean, that's worrisome. Yeah. I mean, we talk in modern, you know, secular society about a generation gap. Yeah. Well, the church definitely has a generation gap on the Israel issue. But as you know, Carl, you're a pastor and a scholar and a, you know, a theologian <laughs> yourself. This is a bigger issue because we have big gaps on fundamental Judeo-Christian values, on on abortion, on yeah. on marriage, on on, on a range, on, on the supremacy and sufficiency of Scripture. This generation gap is having multiple uh, challenging effects, uh, sure. but Israel is definitely one of those areas. Well, and you've addressed something that is maybe another topic for another podcast, which is the the fruits of some of that root cause do have impacts for evangelicals around the world thinking and being taught and being uh, preached to about certain positions and theologies that have impacts for a wide range of subjects that you just mentioned. But we're talking specifically about Israel and the way in which uh, your ministry, the Joshua Fund, has you know sort of addressed itself to both Israel and Palestinians in the context of we love both. We follow what Jesus wants us to do. So, so we're not saying, and I think your, your survey is not saying that it's right to support Israel and wrong to support the Palestinians. It's one way or the other. What it is, is saying there's a difference in how evangelicals support Israel. And because the way the culture is defining that as an either or, not a both and, that could be troubling. That could really cause some problems for Israel. At least that's one of the takeaways that I have, which is as the culture continually defines this as a choice to make, either you support Israel or you support the Palestinians, and the way that becomes so polarized, that's the problem here, is that we're seeing a reflection of the polarization rather than sort of a love for both and a willingness to say we support the cause of Jesus in this region and want to create, you know, some responses around that. Two quick points, or I don't know if they're going to be quick. I hope they're quick. You're right. The first point is that you're right that the survey itself didn't um, require of a person to, to have a position one way or the other. The, these were two academic scholars, University of North Carolina, super smart guys, Jewish. They don't believe in Jesus, but they're fascinated with where evangelicals come out on these various issues, and they just want to know. <laughs> and we wanted to know, and that's point number one, that the survey itself didn't take a position. Mm -hmm. Point number two, however, is I take a position. God does want us 
to have a, a great understanding of, of his love for Israel and the Jewish people. He describes Israel multiple times in the Bible as the apple of his eye. Mm. And that's the pupil, right? Think of when Jesus talked about, if you want to take a speck out of your brother's eye, you need to be careful, right? Uh, why don't you first take the log out of your own eye? Coming in and threatening to you know, put your finger in somebody's eye, yeah. even if you're trying to be helpful, people pull back yeah. because your eye is one of the most sensitive organs in the body. And the idea of somebody else's finger, rough, soft, clean, dirty, <laughs> you know, with antiseptic, uh, you know, hand cleanser or not, like even more these days, right? Uh, the need to be gentle. Why? Because it's so valuable. Mm. You know, I mean, yes, there are blind people who function by the grace of God, but we generally think of we can't function if our eye is, is messed up. Mm. God is saying Israel is so important to me that the language I'm going to explain to the world of why it's so important to me or, or how important it is, to me is that it's the apple of my eye. Yeah. Don't mess with it. Yeah. Now, it doesn't mean that your eye is always going to be clear. It's all, you know, sometimes there's infections, sometimes there's trouble. Yeah. It doesn't mean that the Bible doesn't speak of Israel ha making serious mistakes. That's why we needed a Messiah to begin with, right? And and why we need redemption, why we need forgiveness. But yeah. the apple of my eye, God is saying this is super central yeah. to who I am as the God of the universe. And it's super important and it's super sensitive. And he goes on to call himself the God of Israel. Yeah. So I think it's important. And I think that Christians understandably want to be fair. And that means, well, does God only love Israel? No. Mm. But he's, he really loves Israel. And he's using language from Genesis to Revelation about how much he loves Israel. He yeah. even has, you know, the three chapters, which we'll, we should do a podcast on uh, all of it, how Paul describes Romans in 9, 10, and 11. He's explaining to the Gentile church, look, 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 I get it. You're not Jewish. I totally get it. But you have to understand yeah. how important Israel and the Jewish people are yeah. to me, God is saying. So I don't think of that it's good to be neutral, yeah. but it is important to be compassionate and balanced theologically, there is a special place in God's heart for Israel, yes. but it's not exclusive. And I think it's important uh, as we say that right up front. We've got to take a quick break here right now, but when we come back, I want to get into this question of evangelical support for Israel, what it means as evangelicals, and what are some of the concerns not only that we should have for Israel, but that we should have for the evangelical church when it comes to the, the results of these surveys. So um, we're going to take a quick break right now, and we'll get back to that in a second. Hi, this is Joel Rosenberg. If you've enjoyed this podcast, let us know. Go to joshuafund.com and use the Contact Us form to provide feedback. Likewise, if you'd like this podcast to continue, you can donate through our giving page, and you can find that link in the upper right-hand corner at joshuafund.com. Joel, we're back, and I just want us to take a pause for a second here, because you know we've done a podcast on the idea of what does it mean to be a chosen people, um, and and I think you did an excellent job of pointing out about how you know God's word you know, centralizes Israel and how it prioritizes Israel in many ways, God's apple of his eye, that we need to be concerned about how we view Israel. And this survey that we've been talking about has some very troubling elements in relationship to that. So just elaborate a little bit more, if you will, on what it means for evangelicals as we see this support for Israel declining. What does it mean, like you said, yeah. for for some of our understanding of what Paul wrote in Romans and various other parts of the New Testament? And, and, and Happy to do it, yeah. Uh, and let's recap just uh, for people just uh, coming into this moment on the podcast. We found that only 12% in this new survey just taken uh, in 2021 and released in December, that only 12% of evangelical Christians under the age of 30 say they strongly support the nation of Israel. 
And if you add people who lean, lean like, ah, I guess I support somewhat, I don't know, you get up to 30%, roughly, 29%. So that's a problem. And it's half the number of the parents and grandparents. So that is a problem. Take a few other just, uh, I think, factoids here, which I think are, are worth noting. If you ask younger evangelicals, well, okay, only 12% of you support Israel, but do you support the Palestinian cause? 45.4% say they support the Palestinian cause. Four times more young evangelicals support the Palestinian cause than the Israeli cause. Okay, mm-hmm. Four times more. That's stunning. By contrast, older evangelicals, those age 30 and older, you know, the parents and the grandparents, uh, as it were, only 12.3% of older evangelicals say they support the Palestinian cause. Now, again, the pollsters used the word cause, right, rather than the Palestinian people, Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. right? So compassion, well, I support the Palestinian people. I love the Palestinian people, and I've gotten to know many. Yes, there are Palestinians, just like there are Israelis, who I'm like, "Mm, not so fond of. (laughs) But as Christians, we have to, we're supposed to, we're commanded to love them. But the Palestinian cause is a theological position, it's a political position, it's a geopolitical position. The pollsters are basically pitting one side or the other. Which side are you on? And young people, young evangelicals under 30 are saying four times more were for the Palestinians and their cause politically, theologically, than uh, we are for Israelis. The recent Gaza war yeah. recent at least when we're recording this it was uh, about eight months seven eight months ago in may of 2021 just a few thoughts and then i think it'll become clear what the effect of this is if you extrapolate this out five years 10 years 15 20 years only 31 percent of evangelicals under the age of 30 said that they sided with israel during the war now 26% of younger evangelicals said they sided with the Palestinians. So that's interesting because by a slight margin of five points, younger evangelicals in the United States said they supported Israel a little bit more than, than the percentage that supported the Palestinians. Mm. Again, I think this is a challenging set of questions because the pollsters didn't dive into, okay, why? Right. So here's another number it, uh, that I think is worth noting, which is 36% of younger evangelicals said they didn't take either side. Hmm. No, I'm, I'm not for either side. Older evangelicals, 38% said they weren't for either side. And I didn't go through the numbers, but older evangelicals were much more supportive of Israel during the war and much less supportive of the Palestinians. Now, again, I'm not, not being critical of my colleagues who designed this particular survey. I wasn't involved in, in the formulating of the questions, but you, I think it's important at some point you'd, you'd want to say, well, there's a difference between do you support the Hamas cause, mm. right? That's the terrorist organization that runs the Gaza Strip, or do you support the Israeli cause? Because supporting a terrorist organization is very different. The Palestinian people who are suffering yeah. in Gaza, who okay. are under the tyranny of mm-hmm. the terrorists mm-hmm. of Hamas and Islamic Jihad and a few other terror groups. I totally support the Palestinians yeah. of Gaza. I pray for them. I want them to be liberated. But just to be clear, Israel doesn't control or occupy Gaza. Hamas does. Yeah. And there's lots of polling. We'll do another. We should get a, a Palestinian pollster on here to talk about how Palestinians see Hamas. Right. In Gaza, they hate Hamas because Hamas is the oppressors yeah. of the people. So now, if you extrapolate this out, your question is, what's the effect of this? If young people who say they love Jesus and say they love the Bible and say they're evangelicals, if they're turning away from is- support for Israel— even in a wartime situation, which is why I'm bringing this up, you know, even in war, you like, no, no, I, I don't support them or, you know, that becomes a problem for lots of reasons. One of which, of course, is political. And we don't really talk about partisan politics here, but there is a, a general issue of 
the United States alliance, strategic alliance with the state of Israel is strong because of the Christian community's support for Israel. In other words, That's people in the White House or on Capitol Hill, in the House, in the Senate, uh, as well as in the, you know, the governor's houses and the legislatures, they are passing legislation and passing funding and other, you know, supplying military equipment and missile defenses and all these other things for Israel, with Israel, because they strongly support Israel. Now, that's true of the leaders, I mean, of, of the individual politicians in question, but it's also true because in their state, in their districts, are you know, many, many strong, devout followers of Jesus Christ who love Israel mm -hmm. and are telling their elected representatives, you need to do that too. It's very mm -hmm. hard to get elected in, in the United States, in most districts and most states, if you hate Israel or you've turned against Israel. And the Jewish community, you know, we think of, you know, more many people think of the Jewish community as, well, this is the backbone of pro-Israel support. You would think that. But if you look at polling about the Jewish community, American Jews are very split yeah. about Israel. And more importantly, even if every single Jewish person in America was passionate about Israel, and they're not all, it's very split. But if even if they were, this is 2% of the American population, okay? Yeah. Evangelical Christians are roughly about 60 to 70 million if you just generally ask people, are you an evangelical and how do you vote? If you ask them specifically those four questions about, do you believe these things? That's maybe 40 to 45 million, okay? Yeah. So there's a gap in that. But the point is, if that population, which overwhelmingly has supported Israel for the last 75 years or so, mm -hmm. if those numbers start to slide or collapse, you're going to start seeing people elected to the House, to the Senate, to governor's mansions, to state legislatures, and to the presidency who are not supporters of Israel. Mm. And again, not making partisan points here. I'm not trying to tell you the Democrats this, the, the Republicans that, I'll, but, but I'm going to give you an example just so that people hear Bernie Sanders mm -hmm. is Jewish, right? The senator from Vermont, Jewish, independent. He, he sides with the Democrats. But just as an example, he has strong uh, reservations, let's say, and sharp, sharp criticisms of Israel, up to and including often voting against funding for Israeli missile defense systems or other uh, weapon systems. So you'd say, well, yeah. he's Jewish. Doesn't he love Israel? <laughs> well, I'm not going to get into his definition of whether he does or he doesn't. I'm just saying, how does he vote? Now, the bigger concern longer term, even than the political support uh, for Israel, of course, would be, does the church love, pray for, hmm. and support our brothers and sisters in the land of Israel, as well as in the region, and support the need for every person in this land of Israel to at least hear the gospel of Jesus Christ and understand it enough to be able to make a decision for Jesus as the Messiah or against him. But Paul is adamant, adamant in the first chapter of Romans, Romans 1.16, that we cannot be ashamed. He isn't, and he doesn't want anyone else to be ashamed of the gospel because it's the power of God for salvation from hell for everyone who believes to the Jew first and also for the Greek or to the Gentile. So if support for Israel and love for Israel and the Jewish people collapses within the American evangelical community, it's far more significant than Israel not having American military, diplomatic, financial, and political support, which yeah. would isolate Israel in a world of very hostile enemies, yeah. right? But it also, that collapse would also create an environment where fewer people were praying for, financially investing in, standing with our brothers and sisters who want to make sure that every Jewish person in Israel and around the world at least has a chance to make a decision mm. because they've heard the gospel and then they can make their own free choice. But if they have never heard, Paul says, how are they going to believe? And if nobody tells them, how are they going to hear? 
And if nobody sends and funds and encourages and prays for those people, well, then how is someone going to go tell? And what about the Israeli believers themselves? What if no one's standing with them? Anyway, these are the implications, not just for the American evangelical church, but for the global evangelical church. But of course, we're talking about the Americans because that's the survey data that we have. Right. Well, you know, it is one of these things, and most Americans will will acknowledge that our experience with polls is usually about politics. You know, there are other subjects, obviously, every subject out there, but but most Americans come to see polls and and think about these things. But you know, when, uh, let's let's boil this down for everybody for for uh, you know a little bit at the end of this podcast as we kind of analyze the analysis. Uh, we want to talk about the challenges that we're facing right now, that these are real. We want to bring them to a point of, you know, where everybody listening has parents or children or grandparents and some of the things, you know, maybe at their churches or schools that they're hearing and that they're dealing with, you know, they, these are big concerns. And how do we actually take this information at home and say, what's the difference between older generation views on Israel and younger generation views, and how can we begin to look at some of that and understand it from the perspective of, you know, of the older generation that has traditionally, as in the evangelical world, supported Israel? What are some of the yeah. implications for that as you see it? Well, I think there's several things. Let me break it out into two different pieces. First is why do older evangelicals believe differently than their young people? And then also, what is the cause of why these young people don't see Israel the way their parents and grandparents see it? So a couple things. So, so why do older evangelicals, you know, sadly, I now am apparently an older evangelical, <laughs> though I'm technically Welcome I'm in the, the split, right? I'm 54. <laughs> and so I've got, you know, a good 30 year chunk of, you know, swath of people younger than me coming into their adulthood. And then I got maybe another 30 years of people above me. So I'm probably the, the mid-range. Think about our parents and grandparents. They were born into a world in which Israel did not exist. Yeah. And as a result of Israel not existing, of there not being a sovereign Jewish state that had an army and a navy and an air force and all the things that it would need to defend itself, we had the Holocaust. Six million Jews were murdered in a four or five year period, and almost nobody came to their aid until the last possible moment. The six million people in the Jewish community, that was one out of three Jews in the world was exterminated, liquidated, murdered, uh, and many put into gas chambers and ovens by Adolf Hitler and his henchmen. That's what the world looks like if Israel doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. Because people hate Israel anyway. The only question is, we've had anti-Semitism from the beginning of Israel, okay? And the Bible is filled with stories of people trying to not just attack Israel, but annihilate Israel. Hmm. Read the book of Esther. The word annihilate comes up a few times because this Persian regime decides, no, we're not just angry at the Jewish people. We want to liquidate them. And there wasn't a state of Israel that could fight back. So that's one of the implications of a world without an Israel. And many of our grandparents and great-grandparents, they remember that world. Some of them fought to defeat Hitler and, and of course, the Imperial Japanese as well. And they lived at what I call the seam, a prophetic era in which Israel did not exist as a sovereign nation state. And then on May 14th, 1948, became a sovereign nation state, and then had to survive the attacks, the relentless attacks of Israel's enemies and its neighbors. So, and the podcast that we did to kick off season two with John MacArthur, I thought that was so fascinating, Carl. I'm That's so right. glad we did that. And I'm encouraged by the response people are giving to it. And I, and I want to see many, many more people listen to it because he was alive before... Israel was reborn, and, and we talked to him about what did your parents teach you? What did your grandparents teach you? He comes from a, uh, he's the fifth generation of pastors in the MacArthur line, and he talked about his grandfather writing a tract about how 
God loves the Jewish people. He loves the Jewish people and the nation of Israel so much. Israel is going to come back as a sovereign nation state. The man wrote it in the 1800s, well before it actually happened in 1948. So the miracle of seeing Israel come into being, you know, it's like this, the miracle of, of a baby being born. You know, the Bible says, can a nation be born in a day? Apparently, the answer is yes, May 14th, 1948. But then came 1967 in June. I was only two months old, so I didn't really see it. But when Israel was surrounded by enemies again, and Gamal Abdel Nasser, the tyrant of Egypt at the time, said, we're going to throw all the Jews into the sea. We're going to attack, and then we're going to throw all the Jews in the sea. And there was, we're going to kill them all. Mm. Everybody thought that was going to happen, and the world of media at that point was saturating coverage on this moment, and in six days of the six-day war, Israel miraculously won, and on the seventh day, they rested. Mm -hmm. This, even more than 48, was an electric shock to the Christian world who went, whoa, what is happening? Maybe we didn't pay attention for the first 20 years or so of Israel's existence, but we're paying attention now, right? And so that sense of God is on the side of these people. They don't believe in Jesus. We don't agree with them on every issue, whatever, but God is with these people and he's prophetically rebuilding a country from scratch and against all odds. That was exciting to Christians our parents, our grandparents, our great-grandparents. And so that carried along for a long time with a strong love for Israel and a sense that God is with these people and we need to be with them too. Well, and I want to ask one last question that we've dealt with some really dark realities uh, and we want to deal with some hopeful realities. But I do want to, you know, give your thoughts on ways that we can address this question. You know, the uh, the philosopher Santayana said uh, that those that forget history are doomed to repeat it. And, you know, that's often cited about the Holocaust. And I think rightfully so for many in our world today would want to deny that the Holocaust took place. And and so therefore, you know, puts or that it could never happen again. Yeah, it could never happen again. And it's because of that denial of historical facts and, and the lack of teaching about history on this way. What are some of the implications for a church that no longer teaches about the unique story of Israel's refounding, as you just said, and the biblical significance and connection of that? Well, let me be clear, Carl. I think a person can be a devout and sincere, born-again follower of Jesus Christ and not have any understanding of God's love and heart and plan for Israel and the Jewish people. Many. Let me sure. say that again so that it's clear. I believe that a person can be a devout, faithful, born-again follower of Jesus Christ, going to heaven, saved from their sins, um, and not understand why God loves Israel, that he loves Israel, or what that means, why that's important. And I think there are sincere Christians, I meet them all over the United States and all over the world, who just don't see it. I don't want to be pejorative, it, is, it sounds a little bit that way, I, they just don't get it. But by their own definition, I've had major pastors and theologians say to me, I don't think there's anything biblically significant or prophetic about the current modern nation state of Israel. You know, I, I don't hate them, but I... I don't really think it's a, a thing. You know, it's not important to me. So they're not, they're, of course, they're still believers in Jesus. They're still saved. They just don't understand this major element of why God says that he's the God of Israel, that he's the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, that Israel and the Jewish people, Israel as a nation state, but also as an ethnic group, this is the apple of his eye. That's kind of important, right? Mm -hmm. The apple of your eye is important. The apples of my eyes are important. So um, but if a church doesn't see it, there's really two possibilities. Well, there's probably more, but let's just say two for the, to close the program. One possibility is that the pastor just never brings it up, right? I know uh, pastors who I've had long conversations with them about Israel, and they just don't see it as a thing. Uh, the current Israel, they say, is 
they don't see it biblically prophetic or anything like that, but they love the Jewish people. They believe that you should support the Jewish people. They believe you should pray for the Jewish people, that you should tell Jewish people like everybody else in the world about Jesus and about the gospel. And so this is a benign misunderstanding, right? It doesn't have any immediately obvious negative effects, okay? But that's of the pastor. What you don't know is if you're not teaching something that's so clear in the scriptures that God has a a unique and specific love for Israel and the Jewish people. What about the person in the church who has been raised in an anti-Semitic environment, neighborhood, school, home, or is reading, you know, things that are anti-Semitic or, you know, hostile to Israel? And what if nobody's correcting that, right? So a shepherd is responsible for what the sheep eat. And if you're not feeding healthy food, which Paul described as the whole counsel of God, you're going to have unhealthy sheep. Now, it may not immediately turn into a bunch, you know, a a church of anti-Semites. I'm not saying that. But it can. Mm. And if you look at the world of the church in Germany, that's a different program. And, we, you, you know, you would be better mm. to lead that discussion. And maybe we bring in a scholar, maybe Eric Metaxas or somebody, yeah. to talk about what happens when a church doesn't get the Jewish people in Israel. Because what happened to the Lutheran church in Germany, it seemed like, well, what's the, that's not a big deal. There's no Israel around. There's no, what's the problem? Well, the problem came when a dictator named Adolf Hitler rose and said, let's kill all the Jews. Then the church had no moral compass on this issue and was mostly silent. So that's a problem. It's a huge problem. It's a real world problem. We're not talking theory. We're talking, history. you know, we're talking recent history. Yeah. So that's one. But the other, you know, significant problem is if the pastor or theologian or Bible college president or seminary leader or whatever really starts becoming hostile towards Israel, then he or she is proactively doing false teaching and now is purposefully feeding the sheep a poisonous diet that's going to have implications. We've said it before in this program in this podcast, and we're going to keep saying it. Bad theology leads to bad consequences. And it's something we have to take very, very seriously. This is not about you and I saying, oh, I want everyone to join APAC, the American Israel Public Affairs Committee, or everybody should join CUFI, the Christians United for Israel. We're not rallying people in this podcast to political involvement for Israel. That's, that's, I think, in my view, no. personally, an acceptable you know, avenue of supporting Israel, but it's by far not the only, and the church really has to think in a 360 way, what does blessing Israel really mean? What does God mean when he wants us to bless Israel? And the last, oh, I guess point three, I have to say it, is a church that isn't focusing on the love of Israel and the Jewish people is missing the blessing of Genesis chapter 12, which is where I should have started because the entire organization of the Joshua Fund is based on educating and mobilizing Christians to bless Israel and her neighbors according to Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 through 3, which is the Abrahamic covenant, which is if those who bless you, speaking of Israel and the Jewish people, God says, I will bless. And those who curse you, I will curse. Yeah. Well, Joel, I am so glad you brought that up. And I'm so glad you continue to unpack so many of these issues that that would escape our analysis if we didn't stop for a moment and just really pause and look at this question, not through a political or a social lens or even even sort of a historical lens, but but really through the theology of the evangelical church in America and how we can view the epicenter. I love your word that you've shared before. When Jesus talks about love, he talks about love for Israel. God talks about that throughout scripture. He talks about love for the neighbors, if you will, of Israel, those countries immediately surrounding and other things. But as you've also pointed out, Jesus calls us to love not only Israel and the neighbors, but our enemies, the enemies of those in Israel. So loving 
is a hallmark of evangelicals, loving the way Jesus did. And that isn't a political statement whatsoever. That is a biblical statement. And Joel, I want to thank you. Thank you. Thank you. This has been a sobering but necessary and important conversation. Perhaps one of the most important ones. We've, we've already talked about some of the many avenues that we can go down in this road. But in our next podcast, I really want us to focus in and hone in on, on hope. You know, the gospel message is good news. <laughs> we need to get good news into people's hearts and hope into people's hearts through this, this message as well. And, and I will just note that as we talk in the next episode, hope is not only the gospel, meaning salvation. There is hope for how do you educate the next generations of believers on lots of different issues, and particularly God's heart for Israel and the Jewish people. So this is a very practical uh, next program we're going to talk about. Yeah, thanks, Joel. And again, to all our listeners, thank you. If you found this podcast valuable, if you loved what we talked about, if you challenged by what we talked about, please get in touch with us. Let us know who you are. <laughs> we need to know that because it helps us formulate how we respond to the questions and the concerns that you have. If you want to talk to us about any subject, just ask us a question. You can go to joshuafund.com and click on contact us. Uh, feedback from you is incredibly important and valuable as we continue to develop this, uh, this growing podcast. And as always, check out the show notes for anything you heard on the podcast you'd like more information on, specifically the survey we've just referenced. All of that data that we've talked about is there. Please go back to it and then re-listen to what we've talked about on this podcast. And tune in for the next podcast where we talk uh, further about the implications for this survey on evangelical support for Israel. For Joel Rosenberg, I'm Carl Muller. Thanks for listening to this episode of Inside the Epicenter with Joel Rosenberg. <laughs>